Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to be with you all this morning. Uh, we are in the middle of a series where we are talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, my name is Josh, and I'm the senior pastor here, and it's good to be with you all uh, this morning. Our uh, reading today comes from the Gospel of John, where we're going to wrestle with kind of the work of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? Last week, we talked about who the Holy Spirit is, and hang in, because uh, next week, we're going to talk about what, what do Methodists sort of believe about the Holy Spirit, if anything different than uh, other stripes of your neighbors. And so it'll be interesting to talk about some of those things and to wrestle with that together. As we gather in uh, this space today, I want to make you aware of a few things And worship. First is um, out in the narthex, there's a small little um, wooden box right out here. If you got young ones or grandkids, you need to entertain them. There's uh, coloring sheets and crayons and word searches and stuff like that out there for our kiddos. There's also a table uh, with masks and hand sanitizer. If you wanted a mask but uh, you forgot to bring it, feel free to go grab one. It's our gift to you. We don't need it back. Uh, it's yours. Take it. And uh, also in the narthex, we will find the offering plates. We won't be passing them around. And if you call uh, Greenwood UMC home, if you believe in the ministries that this place is doing, and if it's impacted your life in any way, I want to invite you to partner with us to continue those ministries here in this space as we impact not only each other, but also our community, and ultimately, we believe our world as well. So why don't we stand together for our call to worship this morning as we're gathered into this space to hear from God. And Dave, would you come and lead us in that? I will, yes, yes, eventually. So I'll do it now. <laughs> uh, afterwards, uh, today we'll be having a town hall meeting very, very briefly. It'll be about 30 minutes, uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the service too. The Holy Spirit is a faithful guide. At every time and place, the Spirit of God remains on our side. When we wander in the wilderness, the Spirit guides. When uncertainty looms ahead, the Spirit will lead us in goodness and truth. Be still and listen to the Spirit of God. The Spirit speaks and beckons. Follow me. I will guide you. Thank you. 
praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise the Lord in the heights, praise the Lord all his angels, praise the Lord all his hosts, <coughs> praise the Lord sun and moon, praise the Lord all shining stars. Praise the Lord, highest heavens, and all waters above the heavens. Let all things live Establish them forever and ever, and fix their bounds which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and smoke, stormy wind fulfilling God's command.
close enough. So you may not know it from how you've ever seen me dress, but uh, I used to uh, wear a necktie every single day and a button down. I used to always try to dress that way. And you get older and you realize comfort is way more important. Um, <clears throat> well, and you're probably wondering what in the world does this have to do with anything. <clears throat> I'm getting there. <clears throat> um, before I moved to Indiana, one of the little churches I played for is uh, in Ryzen, Arkansas. And if you've never heard of Ryzen, Arkansas, don't feel alone. Because the only people that have heard of Ryzen, Arkansas are the people in Ryzen, Arkansas. Um, and they tend to not leave very much. It's this little tiny town, but it's still the largest town in that county. But Mount Carmel United Methodist Church was actually about 15 miles outside of Ryzen, about four miles off the main road, down this little winding gravel road in the middle of absolute nowhere forest, woods, way out in the middle of the woods. And um, <clears throat> some really great people. That whole church, the, the Sunday school rooms, the sanctuary, the fellowship hall, could fit on this, the whole building could fit on this little stage here, right? It was the tiniest little place. And there were the most faithful 12 to 15 people you could ever imagine in that place. And there was this lady there by the name of Betty, Betty Cummins. And for whatever reason, she thought my neckties were the greatest thing ever. Because about once a month, she would bring me a brand new necktie. Every month. She would, here's, and so, and the last Sunday I played there, before I moved to Indiana, she gave me the greatest thing I'd ever seen. It was a lighted, motorized, revolving tie rack for, to cycle through all of my neckties. Well, so, <clears throat> okay, so you're still wondering, where are we going with this story? All right, I'm going to tie it all back together for you now. I didn't even mean to make that joke just then. <laughs> um, that was pretty good. I don't know my own wit. Okay, well, Miss Betty came to me one day, <clears throat> and she said, I would really love it. If you would, and I'm going to try my best to do her accent, and I, I, re, I remember this just clear as day. Um, I want you to play my favorite song with all of your extra notes, E X T R Y. And and I said, okay, sure. What is that? And she said, it's an old gospel song called Heavenly Sunlight. And I said, okay, I'll do it. Well, I played it for her, and and then. Uh, ended up coming up with another arrangement of it and so that's what we're going to sing this morning and so I always and we lost Miss Betty about oh I think four or five years ago now and so I've always kind of told myself I'll do this at least once a year uh, and so here is a men's gospel uh, barbershop quartet arrangement that I did of this song for Miss Betty Cummins.
At this time, I'd like to invite our children forward for today's children's message. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Good. You guys all ready for summer? Yeah. Yeah. Me too. It's going to be awesome. I'm excited. All right. Today we are talking about the Holy Spirit. And I want to point your attention to something not in here. All right. Can you look past the stained glass windows? And what do you see? Look. Okay. You see light? Do you see any trees out there? You can see trees? You yeah. see the leaves right here? Yeah. And what are they doing? Um, they're, 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 they're waving. They're waving? Are the trees waving? No, the light was waving. making a wave around. Yeah, the wind is moving them. Can you see the wind? Yeah, no. Uh, it's clear. Wind is clear. You can only feel it from going fast. Let's pray. Yeah, no. Yeah, you can see the wind moving all the leaves, can't you? But you can't see it. Yes, you can. In a tornado, you can. No, you can't. You can see all the stuff that the wind picks up. But you actually can't see the wind. Did you know that? But you can see what the wind is doing if you pay really close attention. And today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a lot like that. Sometimes you can't see it. But that doesn't mean it's not there. And if you look closely, you can see what it's doing. You can see what it's doing to the trees. 
You can see what it's doing in people's lives, and you can feel it in our breath. Everybody take a deep breath with me. Let's do it together. Ready? Deep breath in. Deep breath out. That's God's spirit at work in you. And so today we're going to keep talking about the Holy Spirit. All right, let's pray. Let's do praying eyes and praying hands and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for the wind outside and the breath in our lungs and your Holy Spirit. We love you very much. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go on back to your seat. Thank you. If you will stand as you're able for the reading of the Holy Scripture. Our scripture today comes from John 3, verses 6, 5 through 6. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Many of you know this about me, that I look like I'm about 20 years old. I tell people it'll pay off when I'm 60, right? When I'm 60, hopefully I'll look 40. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And so I did this, uh, I did a, a graveside funeral yesterday, and uh, I think I'm turning 37 or 8, you, I'm beginning to lose track. So I'm nearing 40, right, in my mind. And I told them that, and they said, you don't look like it. And I said, I know, I know. Uh, it, it's just uh, these, you know, I don't know what it is, this youthful baby face I have. But I began thinking about that because I've been uh, doing nothing but church work for most of my professional life. When I was 18, I got an internship at my church and I studied and kind of shadowed my youth pastor. I went off to Indiana Wesleyan University and did youth ministry in Hartford City, Hartford City Indiana with, you know, cornfields and 3M. And uh, I did youth ministry up there and then I went to uh, Colorado and did youth ministry, went to California and did youth ministry. So I've always been involved in, in church world. Um, after I finished my undergrad, I went to Cincinnati, Ohio, and I did youth ministry over there in um, what I would say is an urban area in the city. Uh, and I did youth ministry in a historic United Methodist church for three years. And then uh, my wife finished up her master's and we moved to Houston, Texas, where she did some work. And I got out of ministry for a while. And I didn't get out of ministry saying, I am done with this thing. I'm going to go over here and... I don't know, not do that, but I just, I just didn't, you know, it, it didn't work out. I had an interview lined up at a church, and I went, and it didn't, I didn't feel like it was right, and I got involved uh, working retail as a bike tech for a while, and uh, I got involved with Thrivent Financial for Lutherans. Any people who love finances in here? Just me. Two, three, okay, we are weird people. I get it. I, I like numbers. I like them when they have a dollar sign next to it. Then it really makes sense to me. And so I began looking at all that stuff and I was enjoying that. But I was um, sort of, if I'm being really honest with you, I was sort of burned out on ministry. I was sort of not feeling it anymore. I had been around doing youth ministry for five, six, seven, eight years. Uh, and you know, I, and now where I am in my life, looking back then, I'm like, oh, Poor summer child, you know, you know, but like I've been doing it for a while and I was sort of burned out and I began wrestling with God at work in the church. I began wrestling with people who would come to church week after week after week and yet nothing would change. I began wrestling with people who would pray, pray that God would heal them and healing didn't come on this side of eternity. I was wrestling with this, and I began asking myself one question. Did I believe that God was still at work today? Did I believe that? This is why I was burning out, because I wasn't sure I believed that. 
I had sort of believed, right? I believe when I read in the Bible and like the Spirit shows up on Pentecost and the church grows by 3,000 people, it's crazy. Yeah, that totally happened. I wholeheartedly believe that. And then Jesus does all these miracles and the Spirit is alive and they are moving. I believed that. But, you know, the disciples do all this amazing stuff and I hadn't really seen all that amazing stuff. And so I was wrestling with that question. Any of you ever wrestled with that question? Just me? All right. I'm with you. I was like, man, the Spirit totally showed up, but does it show up anymore? Do I believe that God still works miracles today? And I didn't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I really did not know the answer to that question. I was just wrestling with it. And I began um, kind of going to some different churches, and God just used that time to heal my spirit, pardon the pun, and my heart. And I began to say, you know what, I do. I believe God is alive and well. I believe God is alive and well and working. And it was only after I came to that realization that, yes, I believe God was still alive, <laughs> that I could go back and do ministry. Really, that's what led me back to being back involved in ministry, was realizing God was still alive and working and well. This is the question that we're wrestling with today, is what does the Holy Spirit do today? How is the Holy Spirit active, alive, and working in your life and the life of the church today? Yes, we can talk about how it showed up all those years ago. We can talk about how it was alive and well in the 1600s and the 1700s and the 18 and 1900s. We're going to talk about today. What's the Holy Spirit doing now in your life? So if you're just joining us, fear not. Last week we talked about three things. One, that the Holy Spirit is God. So when we talk about God, when we talk about Jesus, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. You can't really divide it all up all neat and nice like people try to do, right? It's called the Trinity for a reason. So we said that when we talk about these things, we're talking about God. The Holy Spirit is God. We identify that the Holy Spirit's also sort of shy. The Holy Spirit likes to defer to other people. The Holy Spirit points us back to Jesus. It doesn't like to take the glory for itself. The Holy Spirit points us back to Jesus. It brings us back to Jesus' teachings, Jesus' life, his ministry, his death, and resurrection. The Holy Spirit guides us back to Jesus. The Holy Spirit points away from itself to the other people in the Trinity. We talked about the Trinity is, is God and how it brings us back to Jesus. We also talked about how the Holy Spirit is where life is. So wherever there is breath and life, that's where the Holy Spirit is. Our text today comes from the Gospel of John. And those of you who are good Bible students will know this is a big old passage. And I only picked two verses because I think that's helpful. <laughs> if we talk about the whole thing, let's recap and get some context here for just a second. Nicodemus is a teacher, and he shows up at night to talk to Jesus, and he's got a couple questions for the man. And he says, uh, Jesus, you are clearly a teacher. You clearly have some authority because you're teaching people to understand things. But I got some questions. And one of the questions is this whole entire, how is this new life thing possible? And Jesus says, it is all about water and the spirit, and the spirit gives birth to life. And they have some other, you know, discussion. And then Jesus tells Nicodemus, says, how are you a pastor and you don't know these things? Well, maybe Nicodemus was wrestling with that first question I was wrestling with, just saying. But I don't know. Jesus confronts Nicodemus and they have this big discussion about the water and the spirit. Jesus says that the spirit really is central to understanding spiritual birth. There's this two-fold piece, the water and the spirit. But this word spirit in Greek is pneuma. Say pneuma with me. Pneuma. And you guys already know this. This is where we get the word for pneumonia. Ah, light bulb, right? And also, it's the same word for breath and the same word for wind. Wind, breath, spirit, all pneuma. It is God's spirit amongst us. So in the following verses, there's a little bit of a word play in the Gospel of John. Jesus says, don't you know that the wind blows where it chooses to go? So it is with the Spirit. Jesus is saying the Spirit cannot be contained within four walls of a church building, Nicodemus. The Spirit is alive and well. It blows wherever it wants. And in that is life and breath and Spirit, all the same word. It's all God's activity. This is the Spirit. Which this just raises a huge question for Nicodemus. He says, how can these things be true? And for me, it raises one big question, really, is what in the world does the Spirit do? 
So what does the Spirit really do? What's the activity of the Holy Spirit? We know it goes where it wants. We know that it is involved in life and birth and rebirth. We know it confuses Nicodemus and it confuses pastors today. <laughs> we know it confuses a lot of us. So how can we think constructively about the Holy Spirit? So I have some reflections on this. Is this everything the Holy Spirit does? No. If you come up to me and say, Pastor, you forgot something, I'm going to say, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Ran out of time. So just a couple of reflections on what the Holy Spirit does today. First, the Holy Spirit saves. The Holy Spirit saves. Second, the Holy Spirit transforms. The Holy Spirit transforms. And third, it guides. It guides. So it saves, it transforms, and it guides. And probably 30 other things as well. <laughs> but today, let's just reflect on those three things. It saves, it transforms, and it guides us. We know that the Holy Spirit is the thing that draws us to God. As Methodists, spoiler alert, we believe this. We believe the Holy Spirit woos us to God. We can't turn to God. Like, we don't really want a whole lot to do with God. Adam and Eve didn't want really a whole lot to do with God, right? The Holy Spirit is the thing that beckons us to God. The Holy Spirit is calling us to be in relationship with God. It is convincing us that God is love and that God loves us. This is the job of the Holy Spirit today. It's saving us from ourselves and calling us back to God. The Holy Spirit saves the first thing it does. This is the whole entire rebirth thing that Nicodemus and Jesus are talking about. The Holy Spirit is involved in saving us and giving us new life and rebirth. The second thing that the Holy Spirit does is it transforms us. There is this idea in America that you should fix yourself. <laughs> there is this idea in America that I like to call bootstrap spirituality. Right? You pull hard enough on those bootstraps and you pull yourself up out of poverty, you will get that job and you go make it happen. Yes, I believe in hard work, but ultimately, I do not believe that I can really change myself. If I could really change myself through enough gumption, there would be no addicts in the world because you just try harder. Just try. There is this epidemic called bootstrap spirituality in American churches, and it's contrary to Scripture. You all know why I know this. Because Paul says there are fruits of the Spirit. It is the Spirit that transforms your heart, not your power of your will. It is God's Spirit living in you, transforming you. And the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the things that have transformative power. And they are gifts of the Spirit. They are fruits of the Spirit living in you. It is the Spirit that transforms us, not ourselves. God's Spirit transforming our hearts. There is also this thing that the, the Spirit does. It transforms us from sort of this idea of me and my relationship with God to something working here in the church. The Spirit is alive and well here in this space as well bringing us together to break bread at the table, to confess Jesus as Lord in baptism, and to proclaim his word week after week after week, and to recite the creeds, and to sing songs, and to pray together. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, you can do that at home in your living room. I promise you can. But there's something powerful when we gather together in this space, and the Spirit is moving us to worship together. So I think the Spirit does transform us individually and together as a church. So. Recapping a little bit, right? Nod your head. You're with me. The Holy Spirit saves. This is the Spirit that woos us to God. The Holy Spirit also transforms us. I'm a firm believer that I can't just create love out of nothing. No matter how hard I try, I am a selfish person. I need the Holy Spirit to change my heart. To change my heart so that eventually I become a loving person. God transforms me. God transforms me. And the third is that the Holy Spirit guides. Doesn't this sound wonderful, that the Holy Spirit guides? I'm here to tell you this is not wonderful. <laughs> this, is, this is very scary things. 
Let me give you an example from Jesus and his own life. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, Jesus is baptized, and immediately after that, it says that the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. The Spirit of God tells Jesus where to go, and it's not some sort of day spa <laughs> where he can, you know, prosper and have wealth and live beyond him. It's like, no, the Spirit guides him into a place where he needs to be, and he goes into the wilderness to prepare, to prepare for his ministry. The Spirit guides us, sometimes in places we don't want to go, sometimes to places we don't want to go. If you've ever been nudged, and you're like, man, I really don't want to call my sister. <laughs> man, I really do not want to call my brother. I don't want to go over and talk to my neighbor right now. I'd much rather go inside. That's the spirit guiding you. Probably to some place you don't want to go, but just maybe to some place you need to go. Maybe to some place you need to go so that the Holy Spirit can do the transformative work that it does. So the Holy Spirit guides us. And it's not just to those places of the wilderness, the places we don't want to go. The Holy Spirit also comes alongside and guides us in those beautiful places as well. In the Old Testament, you have prophets who are resting, and the Holy Spirit comes alongside them in those moments as well. Beautiful moments of joy and respite and peace as well. So it's not all just wilderness journey. But what we are assured of is that the Spirit never leaves us. It always guides us in those places as well. So as we think about that, the Holy Spirit saves, and that the Holy Spirit transforms, and that the Holy Spirit guides us. Can you imagine what would happen in the church if we began to believe that again? I don't know about you, but it's been far too long that I've walked into lots of churches and I felt like we have neglected the Holy Spirit. I think a lot of Christians don't know a lot about the Holy Spirit. They don't really know what it does. What would happen to our church, friends, if we really believed and embraced and understood that it is the Spirit that saves us, and it's the Spirit that transforms us, and it's the Spirit that guides us? All of a sudden, we would be looking for places of new life and transformation and guidance. We would begin all of our committee meetings with prayer, which we do. We would end our time with prayer, which we do. We'd be seeking the Holy Spirit in our life, and it would transform who we are so that ultimately we can spread the good news of Jesus Christ in this community that the Holy Spirit is still, are you ready? Alive and well and moving in this space. And so may we understand that God's Spirit blows where it chooses to, like the wind outside and that it is alive here in this space, still moving and transforming us and guiding us day after day. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Sometimes things happen in your life at strange moments and um, you end up preaching to yourself. <laughs> uh, so just a moment of personal privilege. We had a, a friend whose daughter was diagnosed with basically a, an inoperable brain tumor on her brainstem and she's a child. Um, and I all of a sudden began wrestling with that same question that I was wrestling with. Do I believe that God is still alive and well? What do you do when you get the diagnosis back or when you get the news or whatever it might be? Do you believe that God is still alive and well? Do you believe that God's spirit is still in the miracle business? Do you believe that God still moves mountains? I do. I do. Do I know how that looks and works all the time? No. I'd be lying to you if I said yes. But I do. I believe it. I believe God's spirit is alive and well and moving in God's time and God's space. I don't know what that means. And I, but I do know as we gather here in this space that lots of us all have different journeys. 
I know some of you are going through medical stuff, and you're not sure what God is doing in the middle of that. Some of you are in the middle of life transitions, or maybe you're caring for uh, older parents, or maybe some of you are beginning to care for grandkids a little bit more as your kids are struggling with work or unemployment or whatever it might be. I know that all of us are in different spaces in life. Some of you are you know, looking at summer and you're like, what am I gonna do when I don't have school? Or whatever it is. What's ultimately true is that God will never leave us and God will never forsake us. God will walk alongside us and guide us in those seasons. So in this space, in this time, I'll begin with a short pastoral prayer. And I want to leave some space. If you have a joy or a concern, whatever it is, I'd encourage you to say that aloud. Then after each spoken concern, if we could say it together, Lord, hear our prayer. Then after a moment, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer together. And so together, let us go to God in prayer. Gracious, most merciful and loving God, we are grateful for the day that you've given us, the breath in our lungs and the wind outside and the evidence of life all around us. Help us to see it with fresh eyes today. God, as we gather here in this space, so many of us are um, rocked from the news of the week, the the shooting in Buffalo and, and the news abroad with Russia and all the stuff going on in our world, oftentimes, Lord, we admit that we feel overwhelmed and we sort of begin to become numb to certain things and we sort of shut off different areas. And so, But God, you know ultimately what's going on in the world and you know what's going on in each of our lives. You know what's going on in the lives of our friends and our family, and you know how our hearts can be broken and how we have questions and doubt and how you hold us all the same in the middle of that. Lord, you also know the highs of life that we have as we celebrate graduation, as we celebrate uh, marriages and engagements and all sorts of things with our family. We are excited for those as well. And the same is true, that you hold us in all of that. And so, Lord, for all these joys and all these concerns, we pray that, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, 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 hear our prayer. For the marriage of John and Tanya Martinez. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, for all these things said and those things that we hold in our heart, we lay them at your feet and we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. As a reminder, the sanctuary is open for prayer, um, but not for too long, because directly after this, we're going to have a town hall meeting, which I would encourage you to attend. Uh, I am a believer that brevity is a virtue, and so I'm going to try to keep it to 30 minutes. We will cut, uh, have a dead stop at 45. We're going to talk about our vision, mission, and values, a little bit of the work we did. We'll talk about our building updates, and we'll talk a little bit about our financial picture. But don't worry, we'll do the benediction, we'll have a postlude. Then I'm gonna use the restroom, a five minute break. If you don't wanna stay, 
just say you have to use the restroom and don't come back. <laughs> so receive this blessing. May the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the saving, abiding grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, be with you all until we meet again. Amen. Yeah.